Hello and welcome to the Why Wallow podcast. Um, I'm Rhea Dixon, a netballer for Leeds Rhinos Netball. And I'm joined today, very luckily, uh, by Courtney Winfield-Hill. Um, just <laughs> give us a quick 10 second brief on who you are, please. Oh, <laughs> 10 seconds. Yeah. Courtney Winfield-Hill, wife, auntie, daughter, rugby player, former cricketer, crazy, sport mad, um, <laughs> throw this in there, yeah. my first email address, Groover of Life, <laughs> which Loz gives me so much heckle about. Yeah. But I think that's a really cool yeah, summary I get that. of me. There you go, Groover I'd say, of Life. I've known you about two weeks now and I'd say that's a really good yeah. explanation. <laughs> um, so today, as I've explained already, but um, just for anyone who doesn't know, the Why Wallow podcast um, decided to start just because I think we need a bit more um, honesty and a bit more kind of an idea of raw and relatable stories within sport. Um, You've come to the right person yeah. if you want honesty. <laughs> I think that when, um, like I was saying before, I feel like when I've been kind of going through my sporting journey... I've looked up to certain sports stars and, you know, successful people in sport and thought, wow, like, I'd never get there. They've had, they've done this, this and this, or it was so easy for them, or, like, they've got a completely different mindset to me, so I'll never make it kind of thing. Um, And I think it's just important to make sure that people out there know that we are normal and we are, we have been through hard things, but it's not always like you go through a hard thing and then you get over it and you push through and like all of that. Sometimes you go through a hard thing and it is awful yeah. and you, you do have to kind of find your way around it in a completely non-linear way. So I think, um, yeah, why wallow? Because we are rhinos and we wallow yeah. because um, rhinos wallow in the mud. Um, it's good for their health, it's good for their skin. It's yeah. a good social activity. So and that's why I said to you off, off yeah. uh, Mike before, <laughs> yeah. that I'm really disappointed we haven't got mud masks. I know, I know. We'll bring that in. <laughs> we're learning. We are learning. Um, so, yeah, I think we're just going to wallow in um, your journey My from, mud. Yeah? <laughs> Come back, yeah. <laughs> from where you started um, to where you are now yeah. and just like pick up bits of kind of how you felt during certain times and how you've got to got to where you are yeah. and the different ups and downs that have made you the person you are today plenty of them yeah plenty of them okay yeah, so look forward to it. okay awesome so if we get into it i guess first question is always like how did you start getting into your sport yeah no let's not say your sport now how did you start Just getting sport. into sport yeah um like what were your first kind of sporting memories and stuff first kind of memories well i, I think you know, you talk about your environment, and I had a family who, um, my mum's side of the family were from Victoria. Um, they moved to Queensland, but anybody, any Aussie listeners know the Victorians, it's just in their DNA. Mm. Sport is just, they live and breathe it. Um, so I was constantly surrounded by it. I had my father and my grandfather played in the same cricket team. If it wasn't, you know, conversations or, or people in the family weren't playing I, I reckon from from day dot the moment I had you know vision I was seeing that you know people engaging with or conversing about sport mm-hmm. so it was just our household um, which was terrific my first memories to be honest I I'm not sure that they're ultra young mm-hmm. um, probably it Probably, my, yeah, my very first memory, thinking back, was my dad would always, not always, um, but they, he'd play golf mm-hmm. um, with his buddies and I used to absolute crack tantrums um, because I couldn't go to golf with dad. Mm. Uh, Is that because you wanted to play golf? Or yeah, I just, to... well, I probably wanted to be with dad, yeah. um, but I just wanted to be around golf. Yeah. Um, and... You know, the family will laugh. Sometimes I would be allowed to go with Dad to mm. golf. And they refer to it. I can't really remember it as such, but they'd say, you know, Dad had put me on the on the bag 
and I'd cling to it like a koala mm-hmm. and he'd tug me along on the trolley. Yeah. So that would get me around nine or 18 holes because you know what a three-year-old kid's wow, like. Wow, okay, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, Very patient of him to that. To that well, I'm that. not, yeah, I don't know how often, you know, yeah. what dads are like, no, not today, yeah. mate, it's a special competition, but he's yeah. just out with the boys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but, um, yeah, so that would certainly be some of my early memories. Um, I went to... When we were six, we moved from like a coastal town out to the bush. Mm-hmm. We refer to it as the bush or like more rural Australia. Mm-hmm. Um, and sport was, in those towns, were kind of the only things you could do. Right. I'd say the only things you could do. The you're you're you limited to activities yeah, out there. Yeah. And, but people just seemed to embrace sport. Mm. Uh, I had an awesome PE teacher who, to this day, I still refer to as Mr. Dugdale, he says, Courtney, come on, you can lose the mister. Mm-hmm. But I think I hold him in such high regard still. It is Mr. Dugdale and, you know, people like that, especially a male influence who mm-hmm. taught taught the girls, you know, you can, you can play anything with the boys. Like, everybody's welcome here. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that would probably be my first memories. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what sport did you play with Mr. Doug? Mr. Dugdale. <laughs> yeah. Um... Everything. I suppose as a PE teacher, he um, he covered everything. Mm-hmm. But my biggest ones, I think he was playing this, with the senior rugby league team at the time. Right. Um, the Monto Roos, who was like the little town's rugby league team. I think he was playing with the senior men's team. Um, so he was a good role model. Like We would play rugby league um, and definitely cricket. Definitely athletics. A bit of softball thrown in there mm-hmm. as well. No netball. You know what? I only spoke about this the other day. Yeah. The only reason, like in, in Monto, it was kind of cricket in the summer mm-hmm. and then rugby league or netball in the winter and the boys and girls are go, Yeah. You know, your, your typical boy-girl split. And the only reason I wouldn't play netball because you had to wear skirts. <laughs> yeah. And even in high school, I would have loved to have played netball. Mm. And I went along, I was actually the water girl for my team I'd go to every fixture mm. and perhaps in some way I regret not playing netball because I feel like it would have been a great social time with my buddies but it was fear it, w- it was I just was not prepared to wear a skirt yeah or it's a such dress a shame because I feel like that obviously is an issue for a lot of people yeah. so, and I saw um I was in conversation with someone the other day and they were saying, I don't understand why we still play in dresses because yeah. well, they don't. no one Have chooses. Have you seen any Oz? No. They've who? changed it? Who? Not? Who? I can't remember. I saw it on Facebook Yeah. like a few months back and now the girls can choose or bo- like the boys are playing so much netball yeah, out yeah, there yeah. now. But particularly the girls, they can, as long as it's the same colours and the same kind of design, mm. you can wear bike pants or your bummers, you can wear oh, a right. skirt, you can wear the dress, you can wear the shorts, a yeah. bit like Oztag did. Right. Um, in Australia with mm-hmm. you can wear the really tight little shorts or you can wear the long more basketball yeah, shorts right. if that had been a thing in my day I'm playing netball yeah because it was just a sport you're competing yeah um, you're with your mates mm. but it was it was that simple as that wow do you think that you would have do you feel like the way that your mindset is and the way that you just are as a person you would have gone professional in that ball if you'd have played it oh jeez do you think you would have been do you think you would have been as oh who probably probably not like Mm. probably like anything I uh my perception was very much it was a and and this is from coming from a girl yeah yeah, yeah. it was too girly a bit girly for me and the Mm. whole contact thing oh yeah yeah, I I was no good with that because I, I mucked around with it in in classes and stuff, mm-hmm. and I was no good on the contact. I was always nudging someone or bumping into mm-hmm. people. So, but then, you know, I would have just loved an opportunity to, and I did have an opportunity. It was my choice. What are you talking about, Courtney? I chose not to do it. Yeah. Um, but certainly, were there barriers to it? 100%. Through uniform. Yeah. Sure. But I would have given it a red hot crack. Yeah, like, of course you would. And so I, I, it would have it. For me, it would have come down to who was the coach. Right. Who was the coach? Did I engage with them? Did I connect with them? Mm-hmm. If they were awesome, I probably would have stayed. Like your favourite subject at school. Mm. Favourite subject at school is not often the subject. That you're best It's your teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I had a cool netball coach, perhaps. Mm. Yeah. 
any coaches out there listening Take you note. matter yes yeah. <laughs> so that was uh primary school where you went away from netball and you went into the rugby and cricket uh i was yeah yeah it was primary school so in winter i chose rugby league yeah and i remember having to beg my mum mm. please mum can i play can i go and play footy mm-hmm. and she was so reserved about it and the only way i got around it was one of my really good mates sally gal um was she was a year older than me and she played rugby league mm-hmm. and i said mum sally gal's playing like come on um and she the only way i was allowed to do it was if i wore headgear oh, so right. i had to have the old <laughs> do, you, do you remember uh you won't remember but leanne remember steve renouf steve menzies that kind of headgear which looked like armour. Yeah. But we thought we were pretty cool in the day. So I was like, yep, yeah, cool. Um, if that's the only way I can play rugby league, then yeah, put right. it on my head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> did you always keep it on or did you put it on and then... When we played looking... away games, yeah. um, sometimes my parents didn't always come and watch, so I'd get on the team bus yeah. and travel an hour or <laughs> two. Bye, Mom. And sometimes <laughs> I may have conveniently left it on the bus. Um, yeah. Because it yeah. It wasn't always cool. Yeah. So yeah, I But you didn't suffer. But any. I reckon as kids, like what was I thinking? I'll leave it on the bus. Yeah. Your mum found out before I even got in the door. <laughs> yeah. One of the other parents was like, you know, spoken to her and said, Courtney didn't wear a headgear mm-hmm. today. What was I thinking? <laughs> you try and get around your mums and they always damn know. Yeah, so, so. as we're on the subject of your mum, um, she, so what, did, what would she have preferred if you weren't to play, if you didn't, weren't to beg her to play? Probably rugby? tennis. Okay. Where you couldn't get hurt at all. Okay. <laughs> nah, right. not really. Mm. That's probably more my nana. She mm. actually always used to say that, Courtney, can't you play tennis? Yeah, why do you play this rugby? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know that she really had a preference. All I knew was that she was just a little bit worried about, you know, the contact and, yeah. and being one of very, very few girls playing with the boys. Mm. Um, but Did I think have... I proved to her eventually that I can hold me own. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I get from her. I was going to say, <laughs> we were talking about this before, but where kind of that desire to, like, prove to her that you're that you'll be okay and you can stick up for yourself and like yeah. you, can, you can yeah I, and I knew I was like I'll be fine mum we play at school all the time and like you play at school and not that you can belt each other around play properly but um I'm, I'm gonna be fine and I think that was probably yeah my my own little self-belief at a really early age mm. was I'm gonna be good and I think as well my dad you know I, I definitely get elements from both my parents but my dad would always talk to me about just sticking it to the boys right yeah and he loved that and he really encouraged that Mm. um did you have any siblings yeah i've got um two younger sisters Mm -hmm. um brody who's two and a half years younger than me like obviously a lot of those early years we spent together Mm -hmm. fighting most of them yeah (laughs) (laughs) um best of mates now but yeah and then there's Luca, who's 13 years younger. So she's wow. our little surprise package. So, yeah. you know, she probably didn't shape as much. I probably shaped her more than vice versa. Because, you know, I was a teenager when she was a baby. So, mm. um, And off at boarding school and what have you. But, yeah, maybe mum, mum's willingness to say yes, okay, was a real blessing at that point. Mm. Yeah. And dad having... Well, two when you're growing up, two daughters. <laughs> the old COVID <laughs> Um Your dad having two daughters at the time, do you think that he felt that he had to prepare you kind of to face when when you would approach kind of that man's man's world kind Maybe. of environment? Maybe, and that's a good question. Probably, perhaps I've never asked. Mm. Did he have intentions around building that? Yeah. Um, Because surely, like we were saying, like nature versus nurture, surely you in yourself might have had something against like the netball skirts and stuff like that. But do you think any of that might have come as well, like 
from him that you have to yeah be a certain to way be, yeah definitely be taken and, seriously and stuff um it's probably one of the best things he's taught me mm-hmm. and actually mentioned it like in my wedding speech as a thank you to my parents was um he would always always throw this line at us whether we you know fell over and skinned a bit of bark off or um were a bit upset about anything he would always say hill girls are tough girls Mm. and that um sort of mental programming of no i'm tough and i know you know 30 years on we yeah the whole idea and around tough is it a thing Mm. is it a word we should use um but I suppose what he was trying to do was say, come on, get back up mm-hmm. constantly, was mm. wipe your tears, get back up, have another go, you know, lots of times falling off your push bike and mm. getting whacked at some sort of sport. But obviously that's made you kind of how, that's definitely shaped you into oh, how you are. Yeah, you I are use today. the word programmed. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. wired, mm. you're wired certain ways, aren't you? And like a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. Um. Sometimes it's on the flip, um, and Laura, my wife Loz, will sometimes say to me, "Oh yeah, hill girls are tough girls," because sometimes I'm not as empathetic and right. compassionate yeah. as I could or should be, mm-hmm. um, particularly with a wife hat on. Right. Um. So on one hand, like it's 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 like anything. Your greatest strength is your strength, but go too far, and it's your biggest weakness. Mm-hmm. Um. And you just got to be mindful that others don't always have that same approach or there's better ways to, with yourself. Mm. Sometimes yeah. I do say to myself, hell, girls are tough girls, get up, keep going. But maybe that's the wrong message for myself some days yeah. as well. Can't always be. Mm. The, yeah. So did you take that then into, from primary school into secondary school? Hell, girls are tough yeah. girls. Definitely. Talk, uh, talk to us about your transition from primary to yeah so I went that was very different transition um so (laughs) grew up really um in a really tiny little country town Mm -hmm. and sport was awesome but the opportunities I think um particularly mum but mum and dad realized that I loved my sport and I had a little bit of you know talent within that space Mm -hmm. And they realised that perhaps that that talent was not going to get nurtured as well if I stayed in Monto. Right. Um, you know, we had some terrific... Don't get me wrong, we had terrific teachers and what have you, but it's like anything. It was a small pond, mm. and I think mum and dad were looking for a bigger pond to throw me into, was to it, challenge me. Was Is it kind of where you're from you kind of live there grow up there stay there or is it the sometimes people... yeah yeah definitely um you know it's a very uh rural town country some people will take over a family biz- business or mm-hmm. work on the family property um lots of kids go to boarding school too though lots of kids go to boarding school and return home right and not that there's anything wrong with that mm-hmm. but it's okay if you want to be you know a beef producer or take over the dairy farm, or yeah, yeah. you know, go harvesting for you because your family's got enormous grain property or whatever. But th- that's not where sport was. Yeah, that's not where um, the sporting arenas, so to speak, were in Queensland. You know, I went three hours. I had the option to either go to because um, at that point I was starting to dig my teeth into some um, cricket pathways. Mm-hmm. I had the option to either go to St Margaret's in Brisbane, which was six, seven hours away, uh, where cricket was mainly based, or I could go three hours up the road to Rockhampton, which was the boarding kids there were all country kids. Right. Lots of real real country kids. And, and in the end, I loved cricket, but it was just, I don't know, the city life kind of... I, I wasn't real fond of that. Um... And I just thought, I can kind of get what I want. And I didn't, even at that point, and it's interesting, and I've only really thought about it this second, I never wanted to isolate in one sport. Yeah. And my fear was, probably looking back now, I didn't want to just do cricket mm-hmm. and be sucked into that vacuum. Mm-hmm. Whereas Rocky allowed me to like, just 
do everything. And my, I had a few friends there. Sally Gal, I spoke about her earlier. Yeah. She was two years older than me. She was already at Girls Grammar. And I was like, I'm going there. If Sally yeah. Gal's there, I'm going there. She'll look after me. If it's good enough for Sally Gal, it's good enough for me. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah. And I had my best, my best mate, Kate. She was going as well. And I reckon from the age of probably eight, so year three in mm-hmm. Australia, mum mm-hmm. said, you're going to boarding school. So right. I didn't go till year eight until I was 13. Mm-hmm. Um, but you knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. Yeah. <laughs> like probably for many reasons, it wasn't just sport. Maybe <laughs> mum knew she's going to be an absolute pain in yeah. the ear. So get rid of her. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, it was, it was the best thing. And um, mum and dad, you know, we weren't, we didn't have money coming out of our ears. I say we, they, mm-hmm. um, you know, Money didn't grow on trees, as we always heard as mm-hmm. kids. And some of the financial sacrifices they made to get me to boarding school were enormous. Yeah. And I do hope that they... Well, I did. I was one of the first things I said when I graduated, like, this has been the best thing, and thank you both so much. Um, best thing they could have ever done for me. Mm. Mm. So were you when you went there, you had the idea that you were going for sport and yeah. you knew that you were going to kind yeah. of make it in cricket so I didn't really know I was going to make it in cricket and I mean I always laugh about that comment what is make it yeah no you know like yeah but I I got a I was lucky enough and and that was probably the only reason I went I got a sport scholarship which Mm -hmm. was like half tuition basically um for the first three years of of school um without that perhaps I wouldn't have been lucky enough to mum and dad may not have been able to fund it fully Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I knew I was going, I knew cricket was one of the many things and that was one of the conversations with the scholarship was, we know you love your cricket, but please, we want to put you in different spaces. And I did through high school, I played, um, cricket, not a little bit, but it was more outside all girls school. Cricket wasn't really a thing then. Right. So I played lots of touch footy, touch rugby, as you guys would refer to it. Mm -hmm. Um, water polo, athletic swimming, cross country, um, (laughs) <laughs> not netball, mm-hmm. but soccer, football, sorry, basketball. Mm-hmm. Um, I just try everything. Yeah. And that was what mum drove into me was you're on this sports scholarship. If they ask you to do something, you go do and it. do it. Yeah, wow. You know, and yeah. um, that suited me because... You're into it. I just love it. Yeah. That was my energy space. Um, and then what about like the academic side of things? Are you <laughs> into that at all? No. 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 So like... I wouldn't say I was into it. I wouldn't say um, I'm an empty head either. Yeah. But it wasn't my motivation. No. At all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, like for me, know, when, I was, when I was going through school, I always like whenever anyone asked me what I wanted to do, I'd always say I just want to play that ball. Yeah. But back then... You can't just play, you couldn't just play netball. But now, like, I'm so glad I still, like, for example, I remember one geography teacher was set, said once when I didn't give my homework in, he was like, oh, why, what are we doing? And I said, I had netball, like, I, I couldn't, yeah. I didn't do it. And he was, and he said in front of everyone, well, netball's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, exactly. I think I heard that a lot as a kid as well. And just, like, I guess to now know that it is possible for other kids um, growing up is such a such a positive thing to to know because yeah. otherwise if you're not gifted in mm. academic or you're not interested in that yeah then at least you can follow a passion oh awful really when you think about it yeah and that that was for me as well it was very much okay yeah cool you want to be a, a cricketer or have fun earning peanuts mm. if any was it was it um professional at all yeah eventually eventually um, it got to that space, but it was always constantly, you know, you're leaving and you're thinking about career choices at school, and mm. it was like, well, okay, my gift is, you know, physical, mm-hmm. and wouldn't it be great if you could Make play sure professional yeah. sports straight out of school? Mm. You look at some kids now, and particularly in the male space, kids are on scholarships from, yeah. you know, early days. Mm. Girls are, st- we're still not there. No. We are so far behind. Um, and that was the case. It was like, okay. What are you going to study at university? And yeah. All those things, or you know, get your head down in geography because 
Netball ain't going to pay your bills, Rita. It's just a hobby. It's just like, how crushing is yeah. that? Where I didn't go to a um, co-ed high school, but even as a teacher, like, I found myself saying that mm. to a girl and, and a boy in, in the classroom sat there thinking, well, you know, I'm on a Broncos scholarship or I've got this. Mm. And even out of my mouth, which disappoints me quite a lot, but it came out my mouth because that's the real world, kiddo. Mm-hmm. Sorry, darling, but keep striving in these spaces too because... You never know. It may not... Like, yeah. if it doesn't come off for you... Mm-hmm. And if it does, you ain't going to earn as much as I'll made over here. Mm-hmm. It's awful. Yeah. Did you find that um, any kind of conflict between the academic side and the sports side at school? Um, or yes. was it always just... <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Like, I, I loved some subjects. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I, I, love some, I loved the teachers mm-hmm. that instilled a real passion and love for for their subject um you know i didn't maths was all right but because of mr deeth i i enjoyed going to maths mm. and I, why do i enjoy mr deeth because he asked me how cricket was mm-hmm. simple you know i home ec I, I spoke off off mic before i loved going to cooking and um and sewing like at home ec classes because Mrs. Gunn, she was the most um, petite, beautiful, gentle lady. Mm. Um, but she was English, and we'd always have banter over, you know, the ashes. So I, I loved going to home ec and food tech. Mrs. Well, I, I got a, yeah. I got a feed with it, oh, yeah. you know, like, <laughs> and boarding school food wasn't always terrific, so that was one excuse, but Mrs. Gunn was awesome, she was a real little gentle lady, um, and it was simply the fact that we had a bit of chat around the Ashes cricket, right. or the England v Oz rugby, mm. and we'd always have little bets on, and, and things like that, so she engaged in my space, um, my, t- my PE teacher, um, Miss Luck was just hands down the best thing ever. So and and the subject of course drew me in. Mm-hmm. But academics wise, Mum always pushed me. Like I remember, probably one of my first maths um, results I got back, and I rang Mum. I said, Mum, I got a B plus. Like I was pretty chuffed. And she said, We need to work hard for an A next time, don't you? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, oh no. And she was just very conscious of I was there on a scholarship, Courtney. You dig in. Yeah. And I. I probably didn't dig in academically. I dug in with, with sport. sport and I did everything, but I did so much sport. I just remember like through year 10 particularly, I'd go to training straight after school for whatever sport it was. Prep um, study time was like five o'clock mm-hmm. and I'd actually come upstairs and that year 10, you actually got a little bit more freedom. You could study in your rooms. Right. And I'd sneakily shut my door and go to sleep. I wouldn't be at my desk. I'd go to bed for an hour. I'd wake up, I'd go to dinner, and then after after study, I might get a bit of study done, but and then I'd be in bed earlier. I don't know if maybe at that time I had a, I don't know, a bit of a fatigue issue, mm. but I just crashed. Yeah. And the girls would laugh about it. Oh yeah, she won't be studying; she'll be asleep. Mm. I did. It was. I'd be up early the next day to go and try something. Yeah. Go and train for whatever, but. Um, yeah, and in year twelve particularly, like they year eleven and twelve, year twelve's like our A levels equivalent. Yeah. And there'd be girls and say, "Oh, Courtney, have you started this?" I said, "I haven't even started it. Like, don't ask me what the answer is." That was like, me wouldn't, as well. Yeah. yeah. Didn't have a clue. <laughs> no. Um, when does cricket start getting serious? Well, I guess it's serious, all yeah. yeah. You went for a scholarship, so it was always yeah. serious. So but. it was interesting, hey. Like, I had to do my quick my cricket away from girls grammar girls grammar didn't offer it as a sport at the time so we actually maybe in year 10 we had we had a team but it wasn't a continuous thing mm-hmm. so i had to go and play with the boys a lot i did a lot of representative stuff away um down in brisbane and then we had nationals and all that stuff mm-hmm. but i got to 16 and i quit cricket for three years right so maybe that's my sport scholarship had finished then 
Um, I wasn't bound to doing anything mm. cricket wise. And being a summer sport, like all my friends would be off at the beach mm. for the weekend. And they'd come back saying, oh, it was awesome. And we caught up with this person and that person. And and I'd be with the boys. And in Rockhampton, it's stinking hot. Mm. Like, And you you know what cricket's like. It takes most of your day mm-hmm. to stand around. And at that time, a couple of boys had a few comments. And I cared, but I didn't. Mm. Like, it was like, oh, what, why am I... Why am I here? Mm. When all my mates are over there and just want to hang out with my pals and is this worth it? And I was just like, no, it's not worth it. Did your mum have anything to say about that? You know what, I don't think she did at the time. Yeah. Maybe that's when she's probably, yeah, I'd remember it if she did, Mm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, But I remember my coach, my my state coach, my Queensland coach said, you know, gave me a couple of phone calls and said, come on, you know, let's go. I'd played under 17s from when I was 12. So I was the tiny little, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. tiny little one of the group. And perhaps they saw a bit of potential and they saw, maybe they saw it as a bit wasted. And I was just like, don't even bother. Like, a, for me, once I've made a decision, yeah. I have made a decision. <laughs> Poor Leah. <laughs> um, yeah, once I made a decision, I've made a decision. And, like, don't try and sway me. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that was three years I took off and then I realised after three years I was at university and I was like, I kind of miss that. Mm. Um, Did you do some sport in those in the three oh, years? Oh yeah, 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 Just not yeah. Cricket. everything but really. Wow. Um, and so I, I came back to it. Yeah. And it's always the way, isn't it? If you love something, yeah. or someone, you'll always come back to mm-hmm. them. Um, and I did, and I, I didn't play it though with the intention to play representative cricket again. I played with the men's third and second grade team in Rockhampton at French Wolf Falcons, which was a really awesome and terrific space. Was that a so, done thing for women to play in? No. 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 I think at the time I might have been the only one. There might have been another lady. And then one of my teammates in Jess Jonathan, she played a few years later. But it absolutely wasn't. And Is that because the, the only... standard just wasn't there in women's? There was no women's competition. None. Um, wow. Yeah, so some terrific um, male mentors, and I say the Wellses, um, mm. they're pretty big names in, in Rocky Cricket. They've done so much, but across all the Wells boys and their dad, Pete, um, they were such a terrific influence on, you know, yep, you're a girl, but you're one of us, you're welcome, and they were so supportive. So Big contrast from when you were at school, kind of when those boys had... Yeah, I think, that's, I, I think that's just young boys sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And they're trying to work out their own brains and their own insecurities and right. sometimes it comes out on the girls in a not-so-pleasant way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had, I had pretty thick skin and, you know, you'd eye roll at it. But at the same time, I was yeah, just like, well. yeah, why? Yeah. Why do I need to be in 40-degree heat mm. chasing leather? When all my mates are at the beach, yeah, nah, I'll go to the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair. You would, wouldn't you, yeah. at that age? So then at uni, you went back into playing just for yeah. fun? Yep. Not for representation. No other reason, no. Like yeah. And then what went on from there? I think they just found out I was, you know, I say they, Queensland Cricket found out I was playing again and they just reached out. And at that time, we had a really cool competition. Um, it was like a, they called it the Cricket Australia Cup. It was like a second 11 competi- tier competition. Mm-hmm. And it was only like a week, 10 days of the year. Um, and it was basically those on the cusp of the the state Queensland team, the domestic um, structure, and the young ones coming back through. And they said, here's a cool space. Do you want to come back and get involved? Mm-hmm. I did a couple of, couple of seasons with that. Um, and it was awesome. And the cricket was good, it was competitive, it was with the girls. Mm. Um, Where does that start, that pathway? Was there always a pathway coming up for girls? Yeah, so the pathway was probably like um, when I was there, it was under 17s, under 19s, women's. Yeah. And then Aussie women's. But no Um, clubs, it's like... like... Unless you're in Brisbane or one of your major cities around Australia. 
women's competitions or few and far, far between. Yeah. So, yeah, that was kind of the pathway. And, yeah, back, jump back into that second 11 stuff and it was cool. Mm. It was more the, um, like, the tour and the off-pitch stuff that captured me. Mm -hmm. It was time with the girls, time with the friends. Of course, I'm competitive, so that was awesome. Mm -hmm. But it was a week of your year, so you weren't away from home mm. constantly. But then, you know, after that, I performed okay at some of them second 11 things, and then they they called me up to the Queensland Fire stuff. It was something I never thought I'd really do. Had you finished studying by then? Yeah, yeah. just. Okay. Just. So I think I was a year or so, and then... Sorry, what did you study at uni? I did um, sports science and education. Uh-huh. So the usual the usual female yeah. that was okay at sport in high school, what did she do? She became a female PE teacher because she couldn't play sport. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You laugh about Shame. it, but how often did it happen? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, then, then I was working uh, in Yapoon and I had a full-time job and that was that was a tough balance once I started playing with the senior women's team yeah. in the more professional league. You Being know, a teacher. And teaching. Yeah. Like, um, I'd fly down to Brisbane late Friday afternoon, play a couple of rounds of cricket, and then fly back, you know, whether it be early Monday or Tuesday morning if we went wherever, get on a flight from Brisbane 6 a.m., get into Rocky at 8 a.m., drive half an hour, and I'd literally race into the classroom. Mm. Like, that was pretty hectic. Um, was that professional? We had match payments at that time. Right. So when I first started, it was match payments, and then it started to generate some momentum pretty quickly to, you know, retain the payments, and then, and then a bit more of a full time. But it was hard at that time because, um, once the. Once the money was enough in cricket, mm. to, it was great for a seventeen-year-old right. or someone studying to go. Oh, this is decent cash. Yeah. For me, being a professional of 10 years in an education space, mm -hmm. it was like, that money's still not enough to take me away or to, it's just not, it's not equal yeah. to what I'm currently earning and, and those. But I lost my contract, I got sacked anyway. So, so, that <laughs> so it, was, stopped that, it stopped that decision being made, I suppose. That was after how long? Uh, so I'd spent 10 years from 2008 to two, start of 2018 mm. um, playing cricket and that growth of uh, financial reward, I suppose, across that time. So, mm. Did you as the players have to do anything to kind of drive that professionalism? Yeah, massively. Did you, yeah, what, massively. Did you, what did you have to do? Um, well, and I mean, I say the players... It was a, a very interesting period where the Australian Cricketers Association um, really stepped on board uh, and drove it mm -hmm. for the women's game. Okay. And every every state had their delegates, mm -hmm. um, and and those those girls did a terrific job. People like your yeah, Alex Blackwell's, Lisa Stalakers in particular, Jody Fields. Um, they were probably the biggest drivers of that. They made, they made it happen. Bringing in sponsors at all, like making it more. Uh, I wouldn't even. I'd say higher than that. Yeah. I'd say they work with the ACA to bargain with. The ACA is basically like the, the players union. Yeah. As such. Yeah. And they went to Cricket Australia, or they still continue to go to Cricket Australia and and fight on the players' behalf and. What what they did was enormous for yeah, the game. That's awesome. Yeah. So did you have to? So we've just, in the past, I guess probably four or five years, we've just um, developed the Netball Players Association, um, yeah. where they've definitely pushed to make um, our England Roses contracts better and um, the central contract around our leagues yeah. um, better. But that's run by. Um, a couple of women who uh, have kind of worked in and around England netball and yep. saw that they needed a change. Yep. But as your association was run by players, did you all kind of have to buy into that as 
yeah. as players around the country. Absolutely. How did that work? Like Everyone setting was it on up board. Just straight in. Yeah. Yeah, no questions. Because, well, it, it was, you know, join forces with the ACA. Because at that period, um, early 2000s, sort of, I think I've got the timelines right, but mm. Cricket Australia and the Southern Stars, the women's space, weren't aligned. Mm-hmm. They weren't two very separate entities, which... Who's the Southern Southern Stars? So that was the women's cricket space. Fine, okay. And it was so separate. And then jumping on with the ACA as a collective, um, it just needed to happen. Mm-hmm. And the ACA... You know, they, they were professionals in their space for the men and then, and then we came on and I don't know the numbers. Mm. I don't think there was one female that said no to it. Right. To being involved um, and so, signing up, so to speak, to the, to the ACA. Mm. And then it was in, oh, God, I can't remember now, maybe like 2015, 2016-ish. Mm-hmm. The boys had like a... Um, bargaining agreement period and they the the men the Australia A team I think you know a lot of the the guys then they actually pulled pin on a tour to South Africa I think from memory Mm -hmm. because uh, Cricket Australia weren't coming to the party as much as they'd hoped for the women's game and it was a bit of a blanket Mm. you know get in and support the girls or and they didn't they didn't go on Wow. So, you know, there were times when when the boys dug their heels in for us and mm-hmm. collectively, and you have a look now, like, what that did, how the domestic structure in Australia is set up for cricketers, female cricketers and male cricketers now in Australia is enormous. Mm. Um, it would probably be, hands down, I believe, the best team sport in Australia and you look at from that point in time you know the women's big bash league which is phenomenal um, and you look at on the back of and I've just been out there and unfortunately my wife's on the back end of it but mm. the Australian women's cricket team now are daylight ahead of everybody and perhaps moments like that the shifts in professionalism hundred percent it's down to that Mm, makes all the difference and you know you and I sit here in a netball space I'm really pleased to hear that you guys have got that Mm -hmm. we don't have that in rugby league I don't even know that the men do really and it's a space that intrigues me put it that way yeah you know I ain't going to be playing much longer maybe it's a space that you can go and have you know input and a way to create change. Yeah, I'd love 100%. to explore it. Definitely. Yeah. I think, I don't know what it's like for, uh, in rugby, uh, women's rugby at the moment, but um, there has been a bit of, I guess it's our players not knowing exactly what the NPA does. Yeah. So like, once you're in it and you understand, right, they've managed to bring in like this much money or they've managed to up the salary or yeah. like the the um what's the word like the minimum salary that yeah, they yeah. can get paid um you realize like how much they are pushing forward the sport but i don't know what changes or what what the women would see yeah immediately like what you could well and that's the you thing is you, you're never going to see anything immediately yeah but it takes someone to do something yeah and for people to buy in. Yeah. Yeah. And let's be real, most most players would buy in. Mm. Um, and, it, you know, it's it's just a way forward. Like, players need people to have a voice on their behalf. Mm. We've got, like, enough to think about sometimes. Mm-hmm. And having those conversations can be really quite awkward. Yeah. Um, but, you know, working with your high-end people of, of your governing bodies, they're conversations that need to happen. Mm. Which I, I don't think happen enough. Yeah, now's the time as well. I don't know. Well, let's do, it. let's do it tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not tomorrow. I've got a big week. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I think, well, that's just part of professionalism, isn't it? In mm. any industry, quite often you have, you know, industries with 
And some people like them, some people don't. But mm. unions of such, of such, you know, like you gotta have them. Um, yeah. So back to Queensland. Mm. Ten years at the fire. Pl- at the yep, fire. Queensland fire, Brisbane heat. Yeah. Um, can you describe kind of? Do you remember the conversation where was it the end of the season when they weren't going to renew a contract? Yeah, or? so it was a it was a pretty interesting period leading up to it. Um, like you, currently left foot as well. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I so it was just trying to do timelines here. Had a really decent couple of years. And I was really enjoying it, and then came over here to to England actually to visit Laws. So that would have been twenty sixteen. What year did you meet? Uh, twenty end of 2015. Okay. So I came over here in the June. And I remember sitting on the plane thinking, holy dooly, like far out. My left ankle, it looked like I've got elephantitis. Like it was huge. Mm. I thought that was a bit funny. And uh did some runnings, like I was doing some training and bits over here and I got home and started the the friendlies of the season and I couldn't bowl. It felt like someone was just shooting a, a like an archer had me lined up somewhere in the grandstand. Every time I'd, I'd land on that front foot, it just felt like they shot an arrow through the back of my foot and um, it was really painful and we tried to rehab it and, and then we did some scans and I ended up having to have surgery hoping to be back in can't remember the timelines they gave me six to twelve weeks perhaps mm. were you playing and when how long were you playing on it when it was uh, painful? not all that long mm. um probably just the pre-season yeah anyway i had some surgeries and timelines just kept pushing back and back and back and it just wasn't responding <laughs> you're sitting here nodding <laughs> isn't it awful i i, yeah. I I can very much empathise with you at the minute and, you know, we fought it a lot and then we ended up just going back, scan it again, it was all just clogged up and a bit of a mess. So they went and operated again. So I missed that entire season. Yeah. Um, came over here to England, I took six months off work, came over here, had lined it up with Nottinghamshire to play in the county women's stuff over here yeah. and then that all went belly up because of visa issues. Um. So I came over here and I was like, oh, great, cool. I've taken six months off teaching. Mm-hmm. I need a big pre-season here because I missed the entire of the last year, which was a bit ordinary. Luckily, Visa stopped me playing, but lucky it was the Women's World Cup over here that year, the 50-over World Cup, and um, Lauren's England coach because I was able to travel with the England girls around. Mm. So I was at the hotel and... Her coach at the time, Robbo, said, well, what's Courtney doing? Does she want a bowl? Mm. And I was like, yeah, I need to train anyway, so I wow. wouldn't mind going to Lords. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so Lauren wasn't real fond of that. Why? Oh, uh, because I'm a bit of a mouth. I did see that on one of your <laughs> podcasts. So <laughs> it, was, it was just, yeah, so she was like, yeah, okay, but just do not line her up against me in the nets. Oh, yeah. yeah. She didn't want to face me. I took a little while to realise that that's not what brought the best out in her right. was me being a competitive mouth. Mm-hmm. I was very conscious that it wasn't my space though. So I kept my mouth shut and just bowled. Right. It was really cool. Yeah. So, you know, I got to just bowl to the England girls. And so that was great. Yeah. Access, good facilities. And um, so that was a bit of a saviour. And you were fine on the, on the foot. Yeah. And that was, it was coming back. And then I got back to Australia, played the season, had a couple of games didn't perform, and that were my first few games back. Didn't perform as I'd liked. What's the head? What's the headspace going into that? Oh, just so keen to get back and play. Mm-hmm. Just so keen. Um, Cause I, feel I took like... my first wicket and I cried on pitch. <laughs> um, it had been a really long road, and we were playing New South Wales actually, and it's a very special photo I've got. So, uh, schnicked Alyssa Healy off court by my good buddy Beth Mooney behind the stumps mm-hmm. and you know what cricket huddles are like and I just start crying. Um, what did you it was like I, was, I was just like I, I wasn't sure I was going to 
get back to actually playing again. It just felt like it was... Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> had a few tears and I was just like, I'm just so happy to be playing again. Yeah. Played a couple games, didn't perform as I'd liked, got dropped. Um, At the end of that. Yeah, got dropped through the National Cricket League, didn't play much through the the big bash of that year. And when I did get called back up, I blew my back out trying to unplug a damn cord. Like, my back went on me. So just when I got my opportunity to come back, I couldn't. So it was a bit of an interesting year, and at the end of it, they they didn't recontract me. Um, what did they say? Um, if you don't mind. If you no, don't want to I, I, no I, I don't mind. I'm just, I'm just like... If you rewind to, I wish they'd said more. Mm -hmm. I got the, like, I knew it was probably coming. Um, But I wish more conversations were had and and probably direct with my coach. I would have loved a few more conversations with him at the time. Um, And I knew it was coming and I probably forced them into a corner. Why? Well, I I don't know about forced, but I wasn't going to retire. Mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not saying I quit. Yeah. I give up, mm-hmm. or I'm moving on. Um, I wanted them to say. To say it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was a very, it was a very, very interesting period. But one thing, and he was a former coach. Of, but he sort of headed up the performance stuff a bit more then. Andy Richards was his name, and I love Andy to bits. Hopefully he listens to this actually. He knows it and I've said it to him. Like they actually him and and the head of high performance at the time, Brett came up and they said, No, we'll come and see you and I knew the conversation that was coming. Right. But for them to come to me, to drive an hour and not not me have to go to them mm. and you know, to Take sit with respect. me and say, Look, we're not gonna contract you. Yeah. Um you know, they're always tough conversations to hear but I wanted I wanted them to have the tough conversation mm-hmm. I, I, that might sound weird yeah, yeah. saying it but yeah. um, and it's something I have huge respect for mm-hmm. and I say, I've said to them already like thank you it means a lot for someone to come to me and have a difficult conversation you know from someone particularly Richo who I you know had a lot of respect for like it only built that yeah did you ask questions like during that conversation or um i think you know it was put on me at the time you know you can go back to club cricket and prove yourself and Mm. i kind of laughed at it i thought like are you guys serious Mm. (laughs) and i did i said no i'll either go to another state and play national league um which i didn't explore as much because I think I was fiercely loyal to Queensland. Okay. Um, again, greatest strengths, your greatest weaknesses. Sometimes mm. I couldn't truly see myself playing somewhere else. Yeah. And at that time, like Lauren and I had spent two years coming backwards and forwards from Australia and England, and it was just like, mm, maybe it's time for a change. So well, I went, well, yeah, and that's what I laughed at him. I was like, no, are you serious? No, I'm mm. going to England. See ya. And you knew that, did you make that decision as you knew that conversation was coming? Pretty like much. before? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, pretty much. I was just, I was waiting for that conversation to happen to finalise my other plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose, like I said, I, I probably knew it was coming. Because mm. um, we had some really good up and coming kids. Don't get me wrong, I, d- I do feel like I had more in me. Like, you know, I only had, that, that really only gave me maybe six to nine months back mm-hmm. after rehab and, and surgery and stuff. Um, and I really hadn't played that many games. So I did feel I had more in the tank. Mm. I thought I just needed a bit more time. But obviously professional sport, it's a, it's a business. Yeah. And I understand, you know, I understand them making decisions. They're making decisions for what's best for the team and, and ultimately what keeps them in a job. Mm. You know, it's cutthroat. But it does make th- things like that do make you realise like life goes on oh, yeah. outside of and sport. It does. 
and like some amazing things up. Like me being injured now, as as bad as it is, like I do realise like amazing things are happening around yeah. me. Like I'm forming amazing relationships and doing amazing things. Yeah. Like in other stuff, it like as shit as bad as it is. Yeah. Like netball wise, like I can do. I know. So much. And more. that's probably my life. I always talk about a bit of a life motto is there's silver linings to everything. Mm-hmm. And you may realise that silver lining today, tomorrow, next week, 10 years' time. Yeah, it's best to realise it now. Well, the sooner you do. Yeah. But when you realise it will be the right time to yeah. realise it. Yeah. Um, but like for you in your situation, why is it happening? What's it, what's it giving you? Is it giving you time mm. to make connections elsewhere? to explore your other skills. Um, mm. Cricket. Y- you do cricket. We're getting in the net soon, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> um, absolutely we are. Mm-hmm. But it is. There's silver lines to everything we do. Mm-hmm. And uh, injury's part of it. And Yeah. Maybe it's cool to know that you're realising it yeah. sooner than some people do. Yeah. I think I, I learnt it when I um, didn't get re-offered a contract when I was in Surrey. Um, was that not in Surrey and then you went to Australia? Yeah, yeah, so that so I was there for three years, my first three years of playing Super League netball and then I didn't get re-offered um, basically because my shooting stats weren't good enough. Yeah. Well, I, I made too much, too many errors, yeah. and etc. cetera. Um, and then I remember after that, I was like, well, the world's so big. Like, why yeah. am I here? I've lived in Surrey my whole life. Why am I... Why don't I just go and I can go and play netball elsewhere? I can go and do whatever. So yeah. then that's why I kind of I work for three months to earn enough money to go out and. Yeah. Um, that's what we set off Mark. Like, how courageous is that to? You know, work for three months, splurge probably all of your cash, on rolling the dice mm-hmm. on an opportunity in Australia, and putting yourself out there and. You know, we know what the Australian netball scene's like. It's a big pond. Mm. So in a, in a time of wobble for you, you actually sought out a bigger pond to throw yourself into. Mm. Which I think it's is like, impressive. It's like life experiences as well. Like, I knew that netball's not going anywhere. So if it didn't work out over there, like, I could still come back and... What's the worst thing yeah. that can happen? And I can go and get to see the whole other side of the yeah. world, which so many people don't get to see. And that was the same message, like, my family gave me. And, you know, my mum, <laughs> she's funny, eh? Like, I would say, hey, mum, I've got this opportunity. Like, when I, when I first got my contract for the fire, hey, mum, I, I've got a contract with the fire and they want me to move to Brisbane. Mum would say, fantastic. She always says, fantastic. And mm. I, I say it a lot too. Mm. Now fantastic yes do it Mm -hmm. or like when coming to England talking about rugby fantastic yeah do it it, and if it doesn't work my other family like if it doesn't work come home Mm -hmm. like we'll catch you and it's really cool to to know there's those safety nets Mm. what's the worst thing that can happen Mm -hmm. you get a bit of life experience exactly (laughs) yeah cool I'm going (laughs) So after that, um, getting dropped from um, fire, how long was it between that and... Rugby? Coming over here? A uh, couple of weeks. Really? Yeah. Just packed up and... Yeah. So, well, I'd made the decision. If, if I'm going to sort of play cricket, at that point, I realised, whoa, even if I go to another state, I'm going to have to pack in my job. If I want to be better within this cricket space and to stay in touch with... Because all the other girls, like, I'm going down late at night training sometimes on my own, mm. away from the squad because they are training in the day. Mm. It's really quite isolating. For me as a people person, that just sucked. Yeah. Like, hated it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, something's got to change. Work's got to come part-time or finish it wherever I go. But I'd made a decision, like, I need to be over here with Laws. Like, it's... It, you're in relationships because you want to be with somebody, mm-hmm. you know, not just via text and on the phone and FaceTime mm. morning and night. And I was sick of the time zone. I'm up at 4 a.m. Yeah. to talk to Lozzie before you go to train and go to work and then go to training again in the evening. It was draining. That is so tough. Couldn't sustain it. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I knew like there were three elements in my world: my relationship, my <coughs> cricket, mm-hmm. and my job as a head of year teacher, PE teacher at school. Mm. And I wasn't doing any of th- three of them well mm. to what I my standards and something had to give. Right, cool, let's go to England. I didn't have a job here. What I knew I it? couldn't play cricket. Yeah. Like. Why not? Because of the visa issue. So that year with Nottinghamshire that I was meant to play, mm-hmm. there's this whole grey area of if you've been a professional in Australia, you need to be on a sports person visa here. But I hadn't played, you had to have played so many games for Australia to get the sports person. Oh, right. Has so that changed now or is it still? No, I think it's still in place. Oh, right. So I, I had to be here three years um, to play cricket. So I was like, okay, cool. So when we came over, Lauren actually took me to uh, a bit of a delayed um, birthday trip, 30th birthday to Paris. Mm -hmm. So I arrived in England. We literally jetted off to Paris for three days. Mm. Loved it. How cool is Paris? (laughs) Um, And then came back. And I think I had literally that week I engaged with the Rhinos rugby down here. And I had my first sessions. And... On various... Um, Can we go back, just rewind, yeah, rewind to... So you came over, how long were you here for before you started at... Rhinos. Rhinos? Yeah. Two days, went to Paris three days, come back two days and went to Rhinos training. <laughs> so a week. So you, on, were you thinking about this like on your flight on the way Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Before? Like I'd touch base with them. Okay. So... Before you came over? Yeah, before I arrived. Okay. So I knew it was, you know, something I was going to follow up when I got here okay what did you tell that like what was that what how did that conversation go so you remember Joel Moon Leanne um he was here and I worked with his dad at at the college I taught at oh right um was he Aussie he was an Aussie yeah so you know I constantly like Joel would come home usually around October time and he'd be training in the gym and so I kind of sort of knew Joel a little bit via that, but knew his dad really well. Right, I'm going to Leeds, cool. Let me hook you up with Joel. Why don't you play rugby? Yeah, I might. Why not? Can't do that. Let me get Joel. And I think Joel... So sorry. <laughs> why, do, do you it's play like rugby? It's like a washing machine, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> so you um, just say, why don't you play rugby? Yeah, why not? Just like that. Yeah, I'm a bit of a why not girl. That's a bit of a catchphrase. Yeah. Mine. Why not? Yeah, okay, why not? Um... Do you not and think... I loved it as a kid. It was. It was probably, yeah. apart from golf as a koala on dad's yeah. <laughs> bag, was um, I loved rugby league. I just didn't have a pathway in it. Right. If, if rugby league was a, a genuine pathway as a kid, I would have continued it. Mm. It wasn't. So I thought, silver lining is, I've lost my contract. I can't play cricket. Silver lining is, I can play something else now because cricket was so... Um, full on back home mm. that they didn't really like you playing too many other bits I did do a little bit don't get me wrong played a bit of touch rugby or Aussie rules or mm-hmm. but they just and the more professional it became the, yeah. the more it was Mm-mm. we need to wrap you up and fair enough you're their asset mm-hmm. um, did you not have did you have any doubts like when you cause I oh yeah like, I saw like, the Woman of Steel speech, I think I spoke yeah, about Yeah, I watched that. I sat on the floor and literally did the whole sit on the floor and cried and cried and cried. I'd been to one rugby session and Lauren sat with me on the floor and she said, it's going to be all right. Like, it was just change. Yeah. And for me, it was about the people. Some my absolute most bestest friends were in that Queensland fire team and that was the hardest transition mm. was moving up. on from your mates and not seeing them every single day mm-hmm. um did you have a big party before you left no nothing no did you not, not want really to? i'm just trying to think i did with a couple of the girls mm. keep me ring like i had lots of mates but i have very tight you know yeah. Ring. Yeah, yeah um and i kind of just wanted to quietly mm. slip away i did that one i, I did i did did you yeah. <laughs> a lot yeah. of people got a bit weren't happy but I think yeah. for me it's like I don't know I just thought I'll be back kind of thing yeah and okay I'll... well see bloody hell you're only what 24 24 like yeah. you will be back yeah for me at 30 and moving to the other side of the world I knew I wouldn't be back mm. and I 
you know, I quietly slipped away. They wanted to do a presentation to me at our end, annual awards mm. and present me with something and for me to make a bit of a speech. And I was like, no, nah, get stuffed. No Cause way. You, why was that? I, I, I didn't want to be put in the limelight. I think it's an awful way, to be honest. I think it's an awful way. You've just cut my contract, mate. Mm. You've just sacked me. Mm. And now you're asking me to to speak and say thank yous mm. and be all polite. And mm. at the time, I was I still felt I had something in the tank. And I was, I was a bit bitter. Yeah. And I said, no. I will shake the hands of those who I am appreciative of mm-hmm. and the people I need to. I, will sh- I'll, I would prefer, instead of saying a global thank you, everybody, for everything... I will sp- take the time to shake their hand and say thank you. Mm-hmm. And if you get a handshake and a thank you from me, well, they're the people I need to thank on the way out, mm-hmm. which I hope I did. Um, I feel I did, and I hope I did. Um, now you've lost my train Sorry, we're talking about coming... Rhinos. Um, yeah. Rhinos. Did, you, had, you had some doubts. Yeah, of course I had Was doubts. Was it because you were... Well, obviously, like you said, it was change. Mm. But also, like, were you at the standard where... Here? You, yeah, where you where you. Oh, yeah. To I, like, I knew at the first first session I've got something to offer here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that would be my biggest thing. It was just change. Yeah, it was probably just the people. I wasn't... I didn't have my curvies and my moonies and my... It was just discomfort in the people and... Mm. Um, and like on all the other on all the other fronts, like I moved here and I say to Lauren all the time, I put my life into twenty three kilos for you. <laughs> that saying <laughs> comes that saying comes out a lot, but I did like I I cut my job back home, mm. and I had a very decent job as head of year and PE teacher in a terrific school mm. again with awesome staff. I left my family. And I had little nieces and nephews as well. I left cricket. Mm. I left everything. I left my golf club. Oh, I love my golf club. Is it still there? Of course it's yeah. still there. <laughs> Someone looking up. They're, they're always there when I go home. <laughs> but it's like, I left everything for Lauren. And Lauren was then away at camp sometimes. Mm. And I was here by myself. I didn't have the, I didn't have the solid connections of friends and people of employment of you know I established that over a while but initially it was probably the independence I've always been I feel like I've always been really independent especially you know financially independent I do I try not to ask anything of my parents since I left school Mm -hmm. and I came over here and it was almost like I was the stay-at-home wife Lauren was the breadwinner, and I was a bit of a nut. I felt a bit of a, yeah, mm. what's my purpose? Mm. I really was. I was like, what is my purpose now? So what was the thought process going through that? <sighs> honestly. As honestly as you... Yeah. Um, go and find your purpose. Mm. Okay, go and find a purpose. It was a bit like we spoke about a book earlier. Who Moved My Cheese, mm-hmm. best book I've ever read, mm-hmm. apart from Warris Theories, but, um, and Lauren was good for that, you know, she was like, it's okay, like, you've moved a ho- half a planet away, mm-hmm. and when you say it like that, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, cool, it was probably that Hill Girls Are Tough Girls, mm. I sat there, Hill Girls Are Tough Girls, I'm not real tough today, Dad, like, what the hell is wrong with me, and Lauren was good in that space, saying, it's okay, give yourself a chance. You've been here a week, God's sake. Mm-hmm. It'll, it'll grow. Mm-hmm. Work will pick up. Um, and that can be really, that can be so grow. tough for people with, like, some people with mindsets like that will be, oh, your wife's earning money, so you can just sit back and yeah. relax. But for people who are driven and people who are yeah, massively to do things, that can be really, really tough. Enormous. Like, it, it was, like, I was a stay-at-home wife. Mm. I was making sure the house was clean for laws because she, <laughs> she's a bit OCD on the house. Mm-hmm. Making sure that was clean when she got home. And, and there were some weeks I was putting in a timesheet of 10 hours. Mm-hmm. 
and for the most busiest person on this planet sometimes I would race from one thing to another mm -hmm. all the time to the point I made Lauren cry once when she was in Australia and she said this is just not for me following you around racing from this to that yeah like I was so so busy I was occupied constantly mm -hmm. to nothing yeah and I was like and at that time I think it was like April so it was still freezing Watch, so I trained that first week with rugby and then I watched their very, very first game. Um, Cuthbo didn't select me for that first week. I've been here a week training. Fair enough, Cuthbo. <laughs> he said to me, I'd really love to pick you, but these girls are done pre-season. I yeah. said, it's fine, mate, it's fine. And I watched them. At, they played at Oddsall at Bradford. Mm -hmm. It was freezing. Yeah. And Lauren and her dad and her brother and what have you had also come that day and I was in jackets and coats and I was freezing. And I'm watching this game thinking, I can't wait to play because I think I could offer something. Yeah. But at the same and time, what the cold. hell am I <laughs> doing? Like, that was my only doubt was, do, do I think I can get all my layers up <laughs> to do this? Maybe ring me in three months' time. <laughs> it did. And, um, you know, you look for your purpose, you look for your connections, and that is exactly what I've got with the Rhinos. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've got a... A friendship base I've got a purpose I've got challenge I've got competition so yeah did you find that there was a like change in um, like a culture change between well at the time like I come from like cricket in Oz which was a really well-run space mm -hmm. um, and there were things over here when I first entered the Rhinos which I was really impressed by and part of me almost needed a little bit of break, bit of a break from intensity. the intensity of it. Mm -hmm. So I kind of saw it as, oh, a bit of a breathing space. It was mm. quite refreshing and it was probably just what I needed was my life wasn't controlled by an app that told me where to be and what to mm. do every single damn day um, whilst tr trying to juggle work. Um, so it was quite refreshing in one way. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there were some cultural differences. I think it was good though, because Cuthbo being an Aussie, mm -hmm. I really connected with his, you know, his coaching style and he probably brought that and obviously brought that um, professionalism because we had a few really, and we continue to have successful years. Um, but... Yeah, it's, it's probably just the, the resources and the structures and stuff. And that was our very first year as Rhinos, and mm. it's grown since. Um, but it's probably more the approach, mm. players' yeah. approaches. Such as. But you just forget that it's all just, and was in 2018, so new. Yeah. These girls have never experienced more professional spaces before so it's very new for mm -hmm. them whereas you know the boys who come into the senior rhinos you know take for example a, a jack sinfield or in your case i don't i'm not familiar with your academy so i know we've got the academy now mm -hmm. but you know a jack sinfield comes into the senior team well drilled yeah not just years. as an athlete mm -hmm. or a rugby player but through the SNC nutrition, psych spaces, everything that goes with it, mm -hmm. the girls never exposed to it before. So, what do you think the that impact has on them? Like, what's? I think it's full on. Yeah. I think it's um, girls are incredibly appreciative for it. Mm -hmm. That's just us as women, isn't mm -hmm. it? We're just so grateful for the opportunity. But on the other hand, it's like. Holy hell, I've got to home, go home and feed my family. Mm. Some of the girls got kids waiting at home for them. Oh my God, I've got to juggle this with work. All the extra stuff that we do, it's, there's layers and layers. Like, But yet we meet it with a smile and we're really mm. grateful. And uh, You know, <coughs> I don't know if you're the, like, you feel the same with netball or you think the academy girls feel the same. Um, <coughs> I think since I learnt a lot when I was probably about 15, 16, when I went into my first um, like 
um, national academy space, so like England under 17s. Yeah. Um, I learned so much about the discipline and about just like being self motivated and yeah. kind of saying no to things and like making sacrifices yeah. and stuff like that. I think I learned so, so much during that space, but I feel now nowadays that has kind of been brought into our academies yeah. and they are more prepared better and transition yeah for yeah i think nowadays but for me like going from like i would just train as tuesday thursday nights as a kid and yeah. then i'd go to super league and we train tuesday thursday night so it wasn't that different mm. but like coming into rhino's environment being a lot more like training most days most mornings yeah um can be a shock for some people yeah. um, who haven't who haven't experienced kind of that high um, high performance side, um, and we have a lot of girls that work full time yeah. that have to take time off work to, to come to training, um, but it's such a hard we're at such a hard place at the moment like trying to organise our training schedule. Mm. Do we organise it? on nights two like two nights a week so that workers can come or yeah. do we want to push it to be more professional I know. and train in the day but do we have the money to do that it's yeah. such a and that was that was where we went through in australia and it's such a ugh, rock and a hard place yeah, isn't it yeah it's like what comes With first cricket, the money or the and to be honest i think it's the money yeah like in australia in the end cricket said right we're at a point now where it's like all or nothing mm. and like I said earlier terrific work from the ACA and Cricket Australia to invest in it I was going to say do you think that came a lot from the men's side of things because um, as netball as a women's sport yeah. we need that investment but you guys are in a, a situation where you are the dominant yeah. you know sex that plays your sport mm -hmm. whereas most other sports aren't mm. Which presents a challenge yeah. in itself. Um, How so? Did that yeah. work where women could then stop working to play cricket, or did yeah. they? Was that kind of how did that go from like a part time wage to full time? Yeah, well, it it literally was it. It on? happened pretty quickly. Yeah, um, you know, we had retainers. So, for example, I, re I reckon at the time, someone like Ash Barty, world number one tennis player, when she had that year off, when she played for the Heat, she would, I, you know, we had retainers at that point. Might have been, um, I, I don't know her contract, but she would have been playing for probably no more than four to $7,000. 3,000 pound world number one tennis player in the world mm. but then it it was think that the following season it just took off and and it was girls were still doing some part-time work they could still do a little bit mm -hmm. but it was very more casual yeah like a couple of girls would work in a coffee shop or um what just to do something different or yeah and some some earn? people need that right don't they like mm. I would need that mm -hmm. I reckon uh some some of the girls still continued to study, but instead of studying full time, they did part time. Mm -hmm. um, but it just needs to happen. Yeah, just needs to happen. Yeah, I know. but it's the governing bodies and whatever else that in in Australia, and it's very different over here. I find, and particularly in the rugby space, um, it's very club driven. Yeah. And I see it even more so in football as well. Mm. You rich clubs, you rich clubs. Your poor clubs, it's so privatised as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Australia it's not, so the governing body went right. Because at the time, New South Wales were dominant. Mm -hmm. They won like 20 championship, like national leagues in a row. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like the rich got rich and the poor got poorer. Mm -hmm. And because they were so successful, they got more sponsors. And with more sponsorship, and they started to pay players to be full-time. Was there and a it cap? was this enormous imbalance. Yeah. Was there a salary cap or a floor that you that they had to um, stick to? I can't really remember. Yeah. But I think they were, they were, and good on them. I, I, I think, I think, I think they were getting some extra stuff from 
some of their sponsors at the time, lend lease perhaps, or... And it was, it was like the rich are getting rich, the poor are getting poorer, and this competition is just so imbalanced. Mm. And it's not good. Mm -hmm. And in the end, Cricket Australia stepped in and they, cricket, the ACA, and they said, right, we're blanketing this. Mm. We're funding it. It's going to come from us. And there will be caps. Right. And you've got this amount of money or this number of players. Uh, I'm not sure what the situation is now. Mm. Which created some player movement out of New South Wales. Or in and around. And it created a much more level competition. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, in turn, for the Australian cricket team, mm. has, you know, absolutely skyrocketed them daylight ahead of anyone else. So on the international level, it's, it's paid dividends there too. That's interesting because we go the other way. So we've got about 20 um, national team full-time. Centrally contracted, yeah. yeah. But then clubs very much like part time or if yeah. that so they it's very much focused on like winning the World Cup Commonwealth Games and yep. then like domestic kind of falls under that. And even like our best English players will be playing out in Australia. Yeah. They won't be playing here. Yeah, they chase it out there. Yeah. Which is really sad but it's the best thing, you know I keep talking cricket, but your domestic competition is is where probably those girls spend most of their time, would mm -hmm. you say, the England girls? Yeah. So if if they're not engaged in a strong domestic competition mm. regularly, then... And then the depth. Mm. Like, I know you don't play with as big as squads, um, but the depth comes into it and mm. longevity and sustainability. Like, I just think it's, it's just so worthwhile. Mm. That's so interesting. I Th think there's that's an true. audience for it. Yeah, I think that's true. But it's like, where does that money come from? Yeah. Because obviously you can support the 20 the top athletes. Because I don't. Yeah. Um, where does that money come from? It, yeah. It comes from a lot of spaces, doesn't it? Mm. And like I said, over here in, in the rugby league spaces, I've noticed, you know, some clubs do it better than others. Mm. Um, and I'd just love to see, for example, like our competition right now is quite lopsided. You could say there's three three clubs between us, St Helens and York, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it's like in your netball space, mm. but because there's absolutely no money really involved, some clubs do, but people funnel into certain clubs for certain reasons, mm. usually the resources... Mm -hmm. And I, none of it, well, not always financial. Um, and other clubs struggle, so our competition, it, like, it's so tough. Until the RFL step in and say, yeah. you know, the only way we can balance our competition, you can't tell a girl right now that she can't sign for that club. Mm -hmm. um, you can't say, well, you, you, we're going to cap you. Mm -hmm. Or you have to. Or move you across. have to move to that. Okay, I, I, you, you tell me, like for example, if they said, "Oh, Courtney, you can't play at Rhinos anymore. You're gonna have to go to Wigan." Okay, so I'm working full time, mm. and I'm not gonna get paid, mm. and I'm gonna travel on the road, and that's yeah. gonna, like it's just, it's not. They no. can't do it. Yeah. Whereas in Australia, because the NRLW is relatively all right paid. Mm -hmm. It's really cool to see they've got some money increases too uh, recently. But mm. they can do that. They can cap it. Mm -hmm. And players will travel move. or move for a certain period of the year mm -hmm. if you're going to get paid. Yeah. If you're not, sorry, I've got to be at home with my children or my work, work or my partner or yeah. my family. Or Can I come back to after what happened after their first game. Hmm. Bradford, the freezing cold yeah. game Bradford. Yeah. yeah, after that. Um, <laughs> after that we went home and I said, I'm not sure I'm going to survive that cold. <laughs> um, and I said to Loz, I, th I think Lauren's dad particularly, like he saw the size of some of the girls and I'm pretty miniature mm. um, in frame. I think he was a bit worried, actually. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'll be right. I'll be sweet. 
Get your headgear off. <laughs> yeah, get me, get me storm cap on. <laughs> um, but I was, I was just like itching at the bit. I was like, right, I'm, I'm, I feel I can have an impact here and I can, mm-hmm. I can help. Um, not that they needed help. They won really well that day. Yeah, and then it was just back to training. And the next week it was against Wigan. And Cuthbo said, I'm playing you this week. Mm-hmm. And I was like, cool. <laughs> and there'd just been a lot of chat. And, and Lauren at home as well, you know, Rhinos v Wigan's a big game. So like a bit of a, what do you call it? Rivalry. Rivalry. Yeah. And I was like, oh, well, that's cool. Like, I don't, I don't understand the rivalries over here. Right. But she kind of tried to explain it to me. Where okay, is she from? York. Okay. Um, but she was a Rhinos fan as a, as a youngster. Mm-hmm. So she kind of tried to explain it to me in, like, Aussie teams. I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Well, this is pretty cool to make your debut game here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, d- don't get me wrong. I was a bit nervous that day. And my first, I'll never forget, like, I ran the ball back off a kick. Holy hell. I did, like, I, I got whacked. And the thought went through my head, I did. In that instant, I thought, Courtney, you're too old and you're too little for this sport. Yeah. And then I did a bit of a length of a picture off a scrum and then I went, nah, you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be just fine, just find space, just don't run into the big ones. Yeah. Um, but it's like anything, you just condition your body to mm-hmm. it. I mean, playing cricket forever, I uh, hadn't exposed myself to the physicality mm. like that. Different. It's very different. Cricket's wear and tear on you and, yeah. and heavy on you still, but not like getting absolutely barreled. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so and then, and then, yeah, went from there and loved every minute of it. What were you doing alongside playing? What were you doing for? I life? was working really casually. Mm-hmm. So I'd work for pro coach. So I'd some days I'd be in schools delivering to little tinies with plastic cricket sets. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I'd be working on our uh, junior girls' pathways here at Yorkshire County Cricket Club. Um, I was just doing bits and pieces, and that was probably for the first two years I did bits and pieces, mm-hmm. work for myself and really sporadic kind of hours. Did you have a plan or, like, a goal when you came over here? Uh, or was it and that, of- There's another thing that was really hard, like... And I do... Uh, I had something to offer the cricket space. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, I could only do that really sporadically. Mm. I say that, but like, let's be real, Yorkshire County Cricket Club men's team weren't going to pick me up as a coach. How many, how many professional men's teams have women on staff? None. The women's space at that time wasn't professional. Mm. do a bit of coaching of a Sunday and through the week in schools that was it mm. um, so as a coach I didn't have a space to to be I suppose a bit more professional in was that difficult? yeah because in Australia we did mm-hmm. and I was like yeah. and you shouldn't but I was like if I was in Australia mm. You'd be able to do, yeah. do this, this and this. This, this and this. But it's grown and it, it's different now. Like I sit here in a space now where I'm a full-time academy coach and a talent development manager and um, I love that space. Mm. But I think, you know, the barrier at the time in the men's space, that that's where the full-time jobs were and... Pff, really? Did you consider, like... Did you approach them and, and, and offer... Um, no, I didn't, and maybe I needed to be a bit more courageous in that. And I had a couple of people like get me involved and, and sort of volunteer or observe. I went in as an uh, as an observer mm. into the men's space, and I, and I have, and from that, like I'd go in and observe, and I still do. I observe in spaces, and I go, I reckon I could offer something there. Mm. Um, yeah, because. Naturally, I think females bring something different. You know, a couple of months back, coaching staff at Yorkshire said, you know, in the academy coach, they mentioned something alongside, along the lines of we need someone who's really nurturing and empathetic in an, in the boys' coaching space. Mm. And I was like, you need a female. Mm. Because even though I'm not the most empathetic and 
I was gonna say nurturing yeah. person in the world. Yeah, you can't. You you can. I can. Yeah. And naturally, I think young men and young boys would naturally look to a female. Yeah. As being more so. Mm. Um, and we know what a, a new generation of people are like. It's about the person, mm-hmm. and what, I, I just think a... I, just, I think females can offer so many different viewpoints. Yeah. In past, particularly, you know, I was a head of year in a pastoral capacity. Mm-hmm. Our young men and women need pastoral people. Mm-hmm. Um, I joke. I joked about it, but all right, I'll put it out there. Maybe I'll. T- well, Gary's going to hear it now. I'd like when Kev Sinfield finish up here. Mm-hmm. I sat here and I went. You know what? I'd love to be the first female that sits in that chair mm-hmm. for the club. Yeah. There you go, Gary. Talk to me about that. Um, <laughs> has it? Is it a consideration for them? I bet you no one's ever thought of that. Mm. Could it, could a female do it? Bloody oath, we could. And I would, you know, there's only one part of me that stops me from thinking like that. I think I think I could offer the men's space something, particularly in the cricket space. But there's one thing that stops me, and if I went to the men's space, mm. the girls miss out on a coach. And I don't think we've got the depth in female coaches right now, mm. so I don't, I don't dare take away from them. Because yeah. they deserve good coaches. And I'm not work, walking away from the girls' space to a boys' space who already get the majority of... The best. The best. Yeah. So I will never completely leave the female space. But I, I don't pigeonhole myself to just female sport either. I don't pigeonhole myself to cricket. Mm. I don't pigeonhole myself to female sport. Like I said, I'm a why not girl. Mm-hmm. I like to do crazy things. I like to challenge a bit of crazy here and there. Mm. Maybe. Amazing. So, that is brings us to, I guess, not now, because we haven't reached now, but like your last few years playing mm. for Rhinos Women. How has that been now that you're set, like settled in and like do you, do you think you're settled in or like oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> now definitely. that you're settled I in I feel and, very at home yeah I feel very at home here it gives me such a sense of belonging and um, it's so cool like I, I come to work here with cricket and on both sides of this stadium literally I'd love an apartment block <laughs> straight above here it's my my sure. favourite two worlds really yeah um and so maybe cool. just zip line into my workspaces, <laughs> that'd be cool. Though. I very much feel at home. Um, yeah, and we've done some really cool things mm-hmm. in the Rhinos rugby league space and it's been really cool to um, to be part of movement. Yeah. It's been nice to see you guys come on board and to interact and come and support you guys and Yeah, we're we're growing. Mm. I'd just love to see a bit more water and fertiliser so we can grow quicker yeah. together. What do you think that next step is? Oh, money. Everything's money, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Let's be real. There's no getting away from it. We've probably spoken a lot around that, but mm. I want to be a part of that. I'm not going to be play- playing forever, mm-hmm. but I want to be a part of the change. Um, I want to be part of that wave. Definitely. Yeah. I think because you've seen it happen as well over in Australia with your with cricket. Yeah. You've definitely got eyes that a lot of people don't have over here because we haven't seen we've seen cricket and football do well. Yeah. But obviously netball, rugby, like a lot mm. of things, a lot of women's sport have still got a lot a long way to go. Oh yeah, we've so we've got enormous growth capacity. Yeah. And that's what frustrates me so much mm. is. I'm no businesswoman. <laughs> I'm no businesswoman, but I look at it and I think, any business, right? Let's say we're builders. Mm-hmm. And we want to start a building p- company. 
To do that, we're going to have to buy a lot of tools. We're going to have to build, buy cars, vans, tools, insurances, this, that and the other. Mm -hmm. And we might not make much money in the first year. But by hell, we're going to, like, as the years go by, mm. we're going to grow our business. Mm -hmm. And I see it exactly the same for female sport. You know what? We may not pack out stadiums today. But if you're willing to invest and maybe lose a bit of money, worst case, mm -hmm. in the first year, think of women's sport in 10 years' time. Will you be reaping the rewards for it then, mm. just like our... Mm. carpentry business <laughs> don't buy the house we build probably yeah. <laughs> I just I just look at it and I think I'm not a business woman but kind of I see opportunity there mm. I think it's a bit it was... like netball in Australia yeah netball Australia had to pay the ABC which is the BBC equivalent I suppose mm. to get it on the television yeah so yeah netball Australia funding the telecast mm -hmm for whatever period it was and now it's like getting cut somewhere. with that they yeah. exposed all these little kids to it mm -hmm. whoop this volume of players come in and then they've got this domestic structure international success sponsors and now the you know they've got media and broadcast people coming to them saying yeah mm. how much how much how much yeah um is that what we need to do here mm an option how many games because you i remember last year you had some games on tv didn't you mm. do you have have you had some this year uh yeah how challenge cup's you? been on bbc yeah um and will be again this weekend and then last year sky sport covered some of our semi-finals and, and yeah, finals. so that. it's not week in week out yeah um but we all know that's where a substantial amount of money comes from yeah but again, it's making our product marketable. The only way we make our product better is time on task. The only way we do that is allowing girls to not have to go to other employment mm. jobs and invest in, in our sports space. Because mm. I find it oh, frustrates me sometimes. Like say, for example, I can be paid in any capacity in the rugby league organisation. Mm except for its main job. Yeah. You know, I couldn't be a... I can be a grounds person. I can be... performance director. I could be a coach with the foundation. I can be a cleaner. I can't right now be paid to be a rugby player, mm. which is our main mm. business. So... One day. Wow. Not today. Yes. But I'm willing to be part of yeah. the tomorrow for the others. Yeah. Amazing. So I guess we are here now. We've reached today in this story, in this wallowing. What would you say the, your biggest, it's probably a classic question, but like be as honest or, you know, however you feel answer the question what is your I'll be honest what, is your, sure. <laughs> what, what has been your biggest like event or time in your life that you that you think you have learned from and what has it taught you to be here mm. it can biggest be a positive or a in my negative uh, probably just Oh, there's so many, there's so many little ones, but simple as coming over here. Mm. Like I said, 23 kilos. And I'm doing things that lots of people dream of. Mm -hmm. Things that I didn't dream of. Um, and it, yeah, it's just... That... When you, when you think, where the hell am I? You come out the other side. Mm. And my stuff's not that bad. Like I don't face all that. I don't. I don't think I face all that much adversity in my life. I really don't. Mm. Um, I consider myself really lucky. But yeah, you know, I continue to go and find the cheese, mm. like that book I spoke about. Mm. Um, yeah, and 
transition like transition from from different spaces constantly yeah what have you learned from that uh, I, I just find like for, for me my biggest thing is um, I love to see spaces where I can build my character yeah so for example if you said to me um, Courtney we're short for netball on the weekend everybody's out with COVID would you play you know what I mean yeah if some people have would go holy hell and there would be a moment of holy hell what yeah are you serious yeah and i know this would never happen we need you to just put a dress on and play put a dress on to start exactly i'd do it i'd 100 percent do it like if you were that down and out and like i just use that space as an example and it's Tracy, right, your coach? Yeah. yeah p- please, Tracy, probably <laughs> look very much further than me. But just, I just like to look at opportunities and go, okay, what? how can I build my character in that situation? Mm. And if I can build my character in that situation, then I'll do it. Why not? Like, I'll take something from it. Well, um, you, get, well you approach it be, with nerves and, like... Oh, there will always doubts. be little bits of nerves and always little bits of doubt. Because mm, I think when I look at people, I think, oh, they don't get nervous about stuff. Or oh, like, all the time. I, st- I still get nervous. Themselves. Yes. Yeah. Enormous. Um, but I think I transition very quickly. Mm-hmm. I get I get a little bit nervous. But as soon as I'm out there, I step onto the pitch, I'm sweet. I just, girls are tough girls. It's, it is. It's literally white line fever. Mm-hmm. And it takes over and I go, right, you're in compete mode. And I kind of glaze over a bit. and um, Yeah. But I, I still get nervous. Still have to, I, I still play mind games with myself in my head. Mm. I have to have a, a voice that I turn the volume up more sometimes. What, and is remind that, what does myself. it say? Oh, well, I only spoke about it. I only actually spoke about it wider than Lauren. For the first time, we did this inspiration session with some groups of kids and parents over at the Nines mm-hmm. tournament we had. First time I've really told anyone about it. 2019 Challenge Cup final. Uh, we played Castleford at Castleford mm-hmm. like two weeks before perhaps in just the round game of the Super League because the, the seasons were sort of intertwined and they beat us 27-0. <laughs> and we didn't look like scoring. Mm. It was awful. Our performance was shocking. Um, and they were they were a really good team that year. And we played them a couple of weeks later in the Challenge Cup. And the night before, I reckon I had played that game 27,000 times in my head. Mm-hmm. I'd hardly slept. Like, everything just was going through my head. I, it was awful. Woke up the next morning and my brain, my brain's just going at me. Um, and it was a moment I was brushing my teeth and mm. I, was, I was exhausted. I felt like I was on empty. Mm. Like, that fuel light was just amber. <laughs> mm. And I thought, I haven't even stepped on the bus and I've got to go out and do battle against a team that's whopped us. And my mind's going... Blah, blah, blah. So, I was brushing my teeth and lucky I had some really cool stuff go on with cricket with a sports psych. And it's just being conscious and aware to it. Like, Mm. this person that's talking to you, you've got control over that. Like, I've got control about the conversation in my own head. So I put my toothbrush down, brush my teeth, and I'm not going to use the words I used, Mm. but I literally looked at myself in the mirror and I pointed at myself and I said it out loud. It was basically along the lines of, Courtney, you're the captain. Mm. Sort your out Mm -hmm. because the other girls don't need this energy Um, sort it out you're the captain and I'll see you tonight when you're when you're a challenge cup winner and I literally pointed at myself in the mirror and I walked out the room (laughs) with my shoulders back and And off I went (laughs) and we did and I was just so conscious that I couldn't be that energy for my girls because I knew they were all going to be on edge themselves mm. and I know that they they often look to the leaders within our group for assurance yeah and I had to do that and if they could if my brain was like if my skull was glass 
they didn't want to be seeing what was going on in there. Mm. So, I just, yeah. You just got to play mind games with yourself and flip it the other way. And I did, and that was one occasion where you just overcome a bit of self-doubt. But that takes practice, though. It is. Mm. It's like anything, it's a skill. And skills probably start with, like I said, awareness. Mm. I am aware of this negative conversation that's going on in my brain right now, and I understand that I can control it to Mm. a degree. I can turn the volume up on the other one. I can remind myself of the times when I've been red hot. Mm. And the times I've been good outweigh the times I've been poor. So that was a bit of a... Hmm. Amazing. I feel like I could pick your brains for hours, but we might stop here. <laughs> because we've been going we'll, we'll do for it a over a coffee. We'll do it over a casual coffee yeah, next and week. Yeah, and a net. Once you're out of the booth. Yes. Amazing. Um, yeah, so we'll wrap up. Just unless awesome. you think you've got any any more wisdom to share. Oh, look, I wouldn't call it wisdom. It's <laughs> it's simply, it's certainly not wisdom. It's just my story, mm. um, and that's part of my story so far. Um, plenty yet to of pages to turn, mm. but um, you know if you know you're part of my story now. You're one of the people I've come across, and I can't wait till I. You know, you've asked me a lot of questions today, but in a more informal capacity over a coffee, I can't wait to pick your brains more. And through story and, and, and sharing, we, you know, we support others. Mm. and Can learn so much. Yeah, especially in the women's sport world. The more we can do that, um, the better for our growth as athletes and, and as young women. Mm. I say young women, I'm bloody old. <laughs> oh, my um, God. No, 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 I'm yet to hit me prime, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, yeah, but seriously, like, it's just about, and it's, it's about, surround, for me, it's about surrounding yourself with like-minded people, and um, in women's sport, I, I speak of it often, where we've got to be each other's cheerleaders, mm. you know. I came to watch you play netball the other week, and I was mesmerised. The girls actually said to me, Courtney, are you all right? I said, yeah, I'm just so taken by this, mm. like, I'm ca- I'm really captured. Um, so even though I have no clue, really, <laughs> of the intricacies that are going on on court, mm. so captured um, by you and, and, and the girls, what you guys do, and we're just like-minded individuals. The more we can surround ourselves mm. with that, the better, and the more we can speak our story for people out there who are listening, then awesome. Mm. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for chatting and obviously best of luck this weekend. Thank you. Can't wait to watch. I'll have a conversation in the mirror, shall I? Definitely. Um, Yeah, Thanks for having me, mate. That's really cool. Um, And we'll wallow another time. Great wallowing. (laughs) Well done. Yay.